Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgbeer, and you're listening to Conversation at the Cutting Edge. Now, when I first started this show two years ago, I made a bold statement. I said that my purpose is to share potentially life-changing information on people, books, discoveries, and resources that you might not otherwise get to hear about. And I was going to do that with a view to shifting your perceptions and offering some new insights on who we are, why we're here, and what we can do if we're prepared to open our minds, expand our awareness, and accept that the only limits that exist are those we place upon ourselves. I also said that my guests would include an eclectic mix of leading experts from what I like to refer to as the far sides of science, education, parenting, bioenergetic medicine, the new kids, and metaphysics. But here's the funny thing. As this shift in consciousness is showing us, that far side isn't quite so far away anymore. And those pioneers working out at the leading edge, like my guest today, are truly demonstrating that we are capable of so much more than we were taught to believe. Today's show definitely meets my criteria for a conversation at the cutting edge, so do stay tuned. Now, a few months ago, I announced the launch of a groundbreaking experiment that could forever change the way the world perceives and approaches the subjects of autism and energetically sensitive kids. Dr. William Tiller, Professor Emeritus, Stanford University, and featured physicist in the movie What the Bleep, and former pediatric speech-language pathologist Susie Miller, MED, founder of Awesomeism, joined forces to spearhead the Autism Intention Experiment Project. Now hear me when I say that while the word autism features prominently in the title of this experiment, the implications are of the utmost relevance to every single one of us because it not only demonstrates how coherent intentions can change physical properties, but that when we create the space of higher consciousness, things can happen in that space that otherwise could not exist. As you will understand when you hear the reports from some of the parents of children who have participated in this experiment, who will be calling into this show to share their experiences a little bit later. When we create the space of higher consciousness, things can happen that otherwise could not exist. Remember that. And if it can happen for the families you're about to hear about, it can most definitely happen for you. And now, Susie Miller, Dr. William Tiller, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much, Bill and Susie. Now, since you've both been on this show before, we won't go too deeply into the history of your research, Dr. Tiller, and the story of your own awakening, Susie, which we know was stimulated by a four-year-old boy diagnosed with autism, as listeners can find our previous interviews in the archive. But I would like to briefly establish a little bit about you both. Susie, if we can start with you. At the time of that big awakening in 1999, you were working as a pediatric speech-language pathologist since then, you've published the seminal book, Awesomeism, A New Way to Understand Autism. You've presented at several international seminars and workshops on awesomeism and multidimensionality. And based on a decade of experience assisting high vibrational children through their integration process, you created OSEP, the Awesomeism Certified Practitioners Program, which now has 50 certified practitioners in 11 countries. With your professional background and having worked with psychologists, social workers, educators, and child development services organizations, you must have been excited by this opportunity to collaborate with Dr. Tiller. So tell us a little bit about how this came about. I actually met Dr. Tiller about eight months ago or so. And, you know, a just year listening. And, a year and three months. A year and three months. Okay, was, thank you December for remembering. 20, well. <laughs> So I met Dr. Tiller a year and three months ago. 2011, pardon me. And when I met him, I met him in a gathering. We were just having conversations of a bunch of, quite frankly, incredible minds coming together and having these discussions. But as we were having that conversation, I began to talk to him about the children diagnosed with autism. He was telling me about his intention experiments and things along those lines. And we, our initial meeting, we actually kind of, you know, separated from and, and that was that. When we came back together again for another meeting, there was just a clear awareness, I think, for both of us that we wanted to engage in this autism intention experiment, that what, you know, Dr. Tiller had been experiencing through his research was 
indicative of the fact that maybe we can make some real change for children diagnosed with autism. And from my perspective, we were working with very energetically aware, energetically sensitive children. So to be able to address them at the level of changing their energetic space, actually creating a space that was conducive to them being here, I was beside myself thrilled <laughs> and still <laughs> am. So. <laughs> So, Dr. Tiller, if I may call you Bill, you've been a pioneer of psychoenergetics since the 1960s. You've worked in private industry as well as as a professor of material science at Stanford for 30 years. You're the author of four groundbreaking books on psychoenergetic science, including Science and Human Transformation, Conscious Acts of Creation, Psychoenergetic Science, and Some Science Adventures with Real Magic, as well as more than 150 published papers concerning unactualized human capabilities, opportunities, and adventures. Now, you've pioneered some of the most scientifically rigorous experiments on intention ever undertaken, and you've created a rigorous experimental protocol for proving that our intentions really can create meaningful alterations in the space around us, as well as within us. What attracted you to join in this experiment with Susie? Um, she's pretty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I won't see you. In any event. Let's see. A good place to start would be in 2003. A lady by the name of uh, Cindy Reed wanted to do a thesis to get a Doctor of Theology degree, and she was interested in doing it with respect to using our techniques of intentionality. And... In particular, she had a good background, and we just ultimately just I agreed, and we decided to do the experiment on diminishing depression and anxiety in a group of people. In essence, she got together a, a group of doctors' subjects, 520 in all in the beginning, and they were located in the middle of. Pennsylvania with some outliers in Guelph, Canada, and basically I agreed, and we she split those into two 260 groups, one to be the treatment group, one to be or the treated group, and one to be the control group, and then later on those in the control group would be treated as well. And the treatment site was near Springfield, Missouri, and the control site was Cedar Rapids, Iowa. So the separation distance to the people being treated was over a 1,000 miles. And the approach was to have the names and addresses of the individuals and scroll them through the computer in the treatment site. The space had to be lifted to a higher gauge symmetry space, which we have found is the basis upon which you can change physical reality and you can change features of important features of the space. So that was the start, and it was an eight-month eight experiment. And at eight months, uh, there was significant reduction in both depression and anxiety for these groups of people. And basically, the p-value was better than 0 0.001. That means that the the probability that that effect could have occurred by random chance was less than 1 in 1,000. So it was a good experiment. When you first met Susie, was it with the results of these, those previous experiments in mind that you began to get the idea that you could make a difference here? Yes. Or did that I come one, later? I, I had one other experiment in between, which was to broadcast to a particular room in a particular house on a particular corner in Berlin, Germany. That was about 6,000 miles away from our laboratory in Payson. When we knew that the broadcast system was not an electromagnetic system, it was something else in nature we didn't know anything about. But that that gave me, that was a very successful one as well, And but it gave me the confidence to perhaps tackle this thing that Susie was dealing with with respect to these children. And my intuition suggested, my working hypothesis was that it would work. Where that came from, I can't really say, but nonetheless, there was. And so I said, let's do it. Let's try this experiment. 
Well, I'm sure Susie can say where it came from because you, Susie, you basically connect with the collective consciousness of the children who've been telling you for a long time that from 2012 onwards they would be present in greater numbers. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I've I've been hearing for quite some time actually a couple different things. One, when I do connect with either individual children or the collective consciousness of of various of collective consciousness of the children, I was hearing over and over again that 2012 would be a very pivotal year as far as the fact that these children would be able to show up. And they were sharing information with me about the fact that there would be new technologies and there would be new ways of supporting them in being present in their physical bodies. Of course, I was hearing this up to five, ten years ago, so when you're hearing it that long ago, 2012 seems like it's so far away, and now that we've hit it and passed, It's just fascinating to me to watch that, in fact, in 2012 is when I met Dr. Tiller and when we began conversations about this project. But the kids also told me to look for him. And so I didn't obviously know that I was looking for Dr. William Tiller, but I did know that I was looking for somebody who would be able to support the integration of children diagnosed with autism and be able to support them through what they were considering a technology. And one of the things that the children said to me over and over again was that none of us can be integrated or can you can't support our integration outside of our soul's purpose, outside of our own soul's journey. And in my own work, that's been very important to me. No matter what support you offer a family or a child, it's always according to their soul's journey. And so when Bill and I started talking about this, and I started looking at the information that he would like to put into these intentions, it just really struck me that that was part of it, that none of this occurs beyond the the child's soul journey. We can't make anything happen beyond the child's soul journey. So, Bill, could you tell us just very briefly a little bit about the device? You've created an intention device, and you imprint it with an intention. How, how easy is that to do? Well, the device itself is remarkably simple. It's just simple electronics, the kind of thing that you might be able to get at Radio Shack in the 1950s, and uh, it's put together in a way that if a good electrical engineer looks at it, they will say it's it's impossible, this can't work. And of course it can't work in the distance time frame of reference, but it can work in a frame of reference beyond distance time. And if you change it so that it works in distance time, it doesn't work in the frame of reference beyond distance time. So there's some interesting magic there, which came about seemingly by a a divine error. But in any event, I found a system that worked, and we could change the properties of materials, we could change the condition of a space. You have to get to a unique level of reality beyond our normal reality, and when you do that, you you can get remarkable things that are not expected in our normal world. For example, when we first imprinted a device, I took that device and an identical unimprinted device, I separated them by about 100 meters, and I turned them off electrically. So nothing should happen, right? Wrong. It (laughs) turned out that within three days, the imprint transferred from the imprinted device to the unimprinted device over a distance of about 100 meters. However, they've been turned off electrically. So we're not using electrical energy, and yet what it says is that information can be transferred in the universe via a different channel than electromagnetic energy. Wow, that's really interesting. And so we found out how to shield that issue, that transfer, but not completely. No matter what shielding material we used, we couldn't stop it from leaking, whatever was doing this coupling, whatever this material, whatever the the energetics of it was, 
It was different than that which we use in our normal world. But we found a way to keep the imprint in the device for basically three to six months by various techniques. And because of that, we could re-imprint on a three-month cycle and therefore keep the juice flowing, whatever kind of juice it is, for years. <music> ¶¶